Hi, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Michaela Harris. I'm the Director of Communications here at the museum. We are very pleased to have author Terry Ryburn with us. Um, this program is being live streamed so that we can have some folks tune in uh, from all over the place. Um, that is thanks to support from WGLT, Bloomington Normal's Public Media, part of the NPR network. Um, after Terry's reading and presentation, she will be answering some questions. I'll be bringing around the microphone. Um, please say your questions into the microphone nice and clearly so that people at home on the live stream can hear your wonderful questions. Um, Terry is a multifaceted, wonderful woman, as many of you probably know. Her passion for Route 66 and travel and adventure in general began as a child when she traveled with her large family from Illinois to California. She is the proprietor of Ryburn Place Gifts and Gab at Sprague Super Service, a two-story Tudor Revival gas station on the 1926 alignment of Route 66 in Normal, Illinois. She didn't start college until age 30 after a divorce. She worked full time while raising two daughters and taking classes part time. It took Terry 21 years, but she received her bachelor's, master's, and a doctorate in history. She wrote her dissertation about Route 66. She retired from Illinois State University where she worked for 26 years. Terry is a writer, an actor, a published playwright, a small business owner, and a stand-up comedian. She lives on Route 66 in Normal with her ghost dog but I'm told that's a whole nother story for another day. So please help me welcome Terry Ryburn. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you tonight, and I know you had a lot, of, a lot of other options for entertainment this evening. For example, at the Normal Theater, they're showing a film called The History of Plastic. <laughs> So the fact that you have selected this means so much to me. Thank you so much. Um, tonight I do want to share stories with you from my childhood. And um, I have written, as you know, this memoir that covers the first 12 years of my life. So I've selected some stories from different chapters of my life to share with you. But first I want to read a poem that I wrote several years ago that sort of sums up this idea of going home again. It's called Pause in the Doorway. You can't go home again, but you can walk through the rooms, feel the worn once roses and ivy linoleum under bare feet. Pause in the doorway. Mama pulls cast iron skillet cornbread from the oven. Daddy jingles coins in his pocket, worrying himself back and forth back and forth across the newspapers Mama spread on her mop this morning kitchen floor. Barb and Mary sit in front of the wood stove, changing their shared Barbie doll into clothes I've sewn from tiny cloth scraps on the Montgomery Ward sewing machine Daddy bought on credit. Benny and Roger vroom vroom metal trucks and cars over imaginary race tracks. Junior's bowed head throws a shadow over the book whose pages he squints to see in the dim light. Dave and Vic argue about whose turn it is to fetch buckets of water from the well or carry an armload of firewood from the yard. Mama turns up the radio and Minnie Pearl shouts, Howdy! All the way from the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. I can't go home again but I can walk through the rooms, feel the linoleum under my bare feet, pause in the doorway. My first story is called Thursday's Child. Thursday's Child has far to go. The Mennonite Hospital building at 807 North Main Street in Bloomington, Illinois, sat along the original alignment of Route 66. On April 15, 1948, Daddy was sent from the labor hall to work at the hospital. He was working one floor above the delivery room at 12.46 p.m. when he heard my insistent cry and rushed downstairs to see his fourth child and first daughter. He used to say, you were late for lunch and you've been hollering your head off ever since. Mama cried the first time she saw me. My only girl and she has to look just like her dad. I did look like daddy down to the widow's peak of my hairline. 
How would Mama ever be able to make this pinched face loud baby whose little bit of hair stuck straight up in coal black tufts into the blonde, blue-eyed, acquiescent little doll that she had prayed for? And what to name this loud, prematurely bald baby? There's no doubt in Daddy's mind, I will be named for his two sisters, Theresa and Lucille. So it makes perfect sense that he often called me sis. Mama and I stayed at the hospital for 10 days, as was customary in 1948, 10 days away from the boys who'd been left with Aunt Margaret. Aunt Margaret had a house full of her own children, so it wasn't easy for her to manage an additional three boys. On the 11th day, Mama bundled me up and took me home to her apartment on the corner of Olive and Lee Streets. Vic sat on the front steps crying perhaps knowing that he was forfeiting his place as youngest and favorite. Now he was the big brother, and soon his long, beautiful, curly, blonde hair would be cut. Inside, Junior and Dave looked at the squirming, squalling bundle and turned back to what they had been doing. So this is a picture of my brothers. Uh, my, let's see, there's my oldest brother, Ray. We always called him Junior, feeding me the bottle. My brother, Vic and my brother Dave, and you're going to hear a lot about these three boys. Two of them were devil children, by the way. Um, but I didn't have long to get used to apartment living because in mid-June, when I was two months old, we moved from South Lee Street into a tent that Daddy had pitched on a hill between Six Points Road and Route 66 near Bloomington, Illinois. It wasn't easy for Mama to take care of a baby and three young boys in a tent. She crumpled up newspapers and burned them to heat my bottles, and my brothers carried water from a neighbor's house for drinking and bathing. When the boys weren't around, Mama hoisted me onto one hip and trekked up the hill to fill the water bucket. When I was fussy and couldn't sleep, the family was gathered up and loaded into whatever car or truck Daddy was driving at the time. A short drive would send me into a sound sleep. It didn't take long to discover that climbing into and starting the car had the same effect. Pavlov's dog salivated at the sound of a bell. I fell into a deep sleep at the sound of a car engine. Later, Daddy built a windowless 10 by 16 foot tar paper shack that we lived in until I was nearly four. Okay, I should have confessed my technology problems right up front. Well, enjoy this lovely picture <laughs> of my three brothers and myself. That is me having a bottle. Um, my brother Vic on the right-hand side, two of his daughters are here tonight, Heidi and Brandy here in the back, and um, they can attest to what an ornery, yeah, what an ornery adult he was, but I'm gonna be sharing some of the things they did as children. Yeah, here we go. We're in business now. Okay, so this is taken at Six Points Road with my mother, my brother Ray, my brother Dave, Vic, and myself. And you can't see it, but I'm petting our dog, Blackie. Um, we always lined up in chronological order. I, I don't know if you did that when you were kids or not, when you had a picture taken, but it was oldest to youngest, so stair steps, we called it. Okay, this was the doll my mother dreamed of in a little frilly dress, and if you could see it, I probably had little frilly socks and sandals, and my hair actually looked, you know, pretty tame at that point. But let me show you the doll that she got. <laughs> I worshiped my brothers, and I wanted to do everything they did. So this is me, and the only way you could tell me from my brother Vic was that I had the doll. That was my, my favorite doll, Linda. And I'm not ashamed to show you this picture, even though it's me a little bit stripped down. Um, we fetched water from the well, you know, when it was on the hill. We had neighbors who had a well, and so they allowed us to 
you know, just get water from that. And then this is one of my favorite pictures. In fact, I used it for the front of the book. This is my dad and obviously the stair-step order of children. And then some of you may remember that you used to have to have your name painted on your truck if you had a commercial truck back in the 50s up through the 60s, I think. So it's Ray Ryburn, Bloomington, Illinois, empty weight, 2430. <clears throat> I wish my mom had gotten more of the truck in the picture and less of the weeds, but there you go. So when um, we moved to Indianapolis Street, this is kind of what my family looked like. I was almost four. And that truck back there is actually the one that we used to take to California when we left. OK. My next story is called A Real Live Doll. In the 1950s, no one ever used the word pregnant. If they spoke of it at all, they said, she's in the family way, or she's that way. I was never told when Mama was going to have a baby. One day she was there, then she was gone, and after a very long time, she was back with the baby in her arms. I'm sitting on the floor playing with my beloved doll, Linda. Mama says, I'm going to be gone for a while, but when I come back, I'm bringing you a real live doll. Oh, I breathe, a real doll? It'll walk and talk and eat, and you can change its diapers, Mama said. Oh boy, I dance around the house. I'm getting a real life doll. I'm getting a real life doll. I sing to my brothers who look up from the cars and trucks they're running along the worn linoleum floor. They don't say anything as I tell my doll Linda, I'm getting a real live doll. Maybe they know what's coming. Something wakes me that night. I sit up and see that someone is undressing behind my bedroom door. I can tell that she's trying to be quiet. She stands there in a white slip. Mama, I whisper. No, she says, it's your cousin Alice. I'm babysitting while your mom's gone. Mama's gone? Where? She'll be back before you know it, she replies. She says this to me every night for a very long time. And every night for a very long time, I cry myself to sleep. I miss Mama. Where is she? They're home, Dave calls from the kitchen. Mama and Daddy are home, Vic hollers. I run from the bedroom and out the kitchen door. Mama is walking up the sidewalk with something bundled up in a blanket. She's home and she has my real live doll with her. I run to her as she stoops down, pulling back the blanket on a red-faced, squalling thing. I step back. Where's my doll? Looking around to see if Daddy is bringing it from the car. Here, Mama says, thrusting the blanket at me. Here's your doll. His name is Roger. I look at the red-faced, wrinkled thing. Take it back, take it back, I shout. I don't want it. I turn and run into the house. I fling myself across my bed, crying into Linda's soft cloth body. Mama didn't take it back, and although it ate and drank and needed its diapers changed, it was a long time before it walked and talked. This one's called Tater Stew. I don't know about you, but I think I was in third grade before I knew it was potato. It was always taters and maters instead of potatoes and tomatoes, so taters stew. We are in the back of Daddy's truck waiting at the Lincoln Street crossing while the train rolls by. We wave to the engineer who waves back and blows the horn. In a small hollow next to the tracks, a group of men sit around a fire smoking cigarettes and drinking from tin cups. One of them raises his hat to us. We wave to him, and the whole group jumps to their feet, waving and hooping and hollering. The train passes, and Daddy drives over the tracks toward home. Mama's voice drifts back from her open window. Don't you kids go anywhere near them hobos. Do you hear me? They'll kidnap you. We hear Mama, but we aren't afraid of hobos. After all, Daddy had been a hobo when he was young, riding the rails looking for work. Yes, sirree, he says, standing in our yard watching those trains roll by in front of our house. I rode the rails during the Depression, crossing the country looking for work. It was all steam engines then. He warms to the memory. Now, some people called us bums, but we was hobos. 
bows. There's a world of difference. We used to say hobos work and wander, bums steal and drink. No self-respecting bow would give the time of day to a bum. Nope, we bows was willing to work for a few dollars or a meal or a place to sleep. I chopped and stacked wood or painted out buildings or whatever else needed doing. When we moved on, we left signs on the house for the next bow. He kneels in the dirt of our yard, picks up a stick and draws an oval. See that there? It means nothing doing here. That way you knew not to even knock on the door. If you got off the train and saw a capital T lean into the left like this, it meant get out. Or three hash marks like this meant unsafe here. You didn't waste time asking why, you just skedaddled. Daddy draws a cross, a line, and a squiggle. Now that's what we wanted to see, food for work. Or as he draws four horizontal lines, one below the other, housewife feeds for chores. Yes siree, we had some good times riding the rails. Daddy stands and pulls a red handkerchief from his back pocket, tying it loosely around his neck. Now this bandana was the most important piece of clothing we owned. We used it to wash up, then soaked it in water and tied it around our necks to keep ourselves cool in the hot sun. Or we tied it around our faces to keep dust and cinders out of our noses and mouths. And if we had any money, we tied it up in the corner like this, tied it, um, tied it to the belt loop on our dungarees and tucked it in. That way no bum could rob us. That was the life. Catching a train, hopping off in a town, reading the signs, doing a little work for food, then hopping the next train. If there wasn't any work, I'd just throw my bedroll up into the freight car and ride till another town caught my eye. Or sometimes I'd hop off at a hobo jungle. I'd sit out under the stars with the other bows enjoying a smoke. Some, somebody'd start a pot of coffee and we'd pull whatever food we'd gathered to make a stew. Maybe somebody had a tater and somebody else an onion. It was a good night when somebody had a slice or two of bacon to toss in. We'd boil that all up together and have us a feast. He laughed. Mm-mm-mm, them was real good eats. He sighs. I'd be riding the rails yet if I hadn't met your mom. Mama's glare ends his story, and he turns and walks into the house. Hey, Vic says after supper, next time we go to Aunt Margaret's, let's take them bows some taters for their stew. Mama will say no. We ain't going to ask Mama. I don't think she liked it that Daddy had so much fun as a bow. Maybe we should ask Daddy then. Nah, Vic says, we'll just go on our own. I hesitate. What if they're bums and not bows, I ask. They're bows, Vic responds, disgusted with my hesitancy. What are you, a chicken? Being a chicken was the worst possible thing you could be accused of. Okay, okay, I'll go. The next week, as we climb into the truck to go visit Aunt Margaret, I whisper to Vic, have you got the taters? He shows me three potatoes that he has stuffed in his shirt, and he's tied Daddy's red bandana around his neck. As Mama and Aunt Margaret talk at the kitchen table, we announce through the screen door that we are going across Lincoln Street to play hide-and-seek in the unkempt old evergreen cemetery. You kids keep away from them hobos. They'll knock you in the head. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Mama shouts to our backs as we slip through the hedge that separates the cemetery from Lincoln Street. We dodge the headstones and head toward the tracks in the hobo jungle. I smell their campfire before I see them. As we approach, we see men sitting around the fire. One strums a guitar, another blows a mournful song on the harmonica. The others stare into the fire, raising cigarettes to their mouths, inhaling deeply and blowing smoke into the flames. Suddenly, the guitar stops in mid-strum. The harmonica falters to a stop. A big man steps menacingly towards us. What do you kids want? He asks gruffly. I stand rooted to the spot and turn to Vic, who seems to have been struck dumb. Well... The man takes another step toward us. I would run if I could uproot myself. We brought you some um, ta taters for your stew, I stammer. What? Vic steps forward, pointing to his lumpy shirt. The man begins to laugh and says, Look here, boys, these kids has brought us some taters. He turns to us. Come on over here and set by the fire. 
He points to a slight, toothless man. You get up off that crate and let these kids set down. Can't you see we got company? We don't move. What's wrong, he asks. Are you bums or bows, I ask. <laughs> he looks puzzled. What difference does that make? Because <clears throat> if you're bums, we'll leave the taters, but we ain't staying. Well, little lady, he laughs, we're hobos. Does that suit you? Vic finally finds his voice as he pokes me with his elbow. I told you they was bows. We slowly approach the fire, sitting gingerly on the vacated wooden crate. The guitar player smiles at us as we pick up, as he picks up where he had left off. The harmonica player joins in, wah wah wahing the tune. What's your names, kids? I'm Vic, and this is Theresa. Nice to meet you, Dick and Teresa, the big man smiles, revealing broken brown teeth. Vic picks up a twig from the ground and breaks it in two, handing a short piece to me. He holds his half of the twig between his fingers and sticks it in his mouth, pretending to draw smoke into his lungs, blowing it out in a big whoosh right into the fire. I do the same, enjoying a companionable smoke with the bows. We can't stay, I say finally, standing up and throwing my cigarette into the flames. We gotta be home before the street lights come on. Vic gets up from the crate. We just wanted to bring you something for your stew. The big man stands and solemnly takes my hand in his rough one. He makes a deep bow. He turns to Vic and claps him on the shoulder. Thank you, kids, for the taters. You'd make good hobos. Vic and I run across the cemetery smelling of wood smoke and tobacco as the streetlights sputter on. When I grow up, I think I will be a hobo sitting in the jungle with the other bows and playing mournful music under the stars while strange children run home to their mothers before the street lights come on. <clears throat> How many of you remember the Phil Cron Drive-In Theater on South Main? Quite a few of you. Well, this is about Buck Knight, and I call it Buck Knight Hero. Daddy is the neighborhood hero on Buck Night when it's only $1 admission for a car or a truck at the Phil Cron Drive-In movie on South Main Street. On a sticky central Illinois summer night, Daddy piles us and as many neighbor kids as he can fit into the back of his truck. Some kids sit in the bed and some on the sides, one or two stand, including Junior, holding onto the two by four framework that Daddy usually keeps his ladders on. You kids set now, Mama shouts out the truck's passenger window. You're going to fall out and kill yourselves. We pretend not to hear and stick our cupped hands out the sides of the truck, trying to catch a breeze. Daddy drives down South Main Street and into the line of cars and trucks waiting to enter the drive-in. He inches the truck up to a booth where the ticket taker gapes and shakes his head. How many kids you got in that truck? Never mind, Daddy says sticking his hand out the window, here's your buck. Daddy merges with the others stuffed with kids' cars and trucks and drives through the lot looking for the perfect parking place. He pulls into a space about halfway back and on the side, angling the front of the truck on the slight incline toward the screen. He doesn't shut off the engine as he leans out and pulls in the speaker. We know better than to get out of the truck. Daddy may have to move to other spaces and fiddle with several speakers before he finds one that works. <clears throat> this one doesn't. He hangs it back on the post and pulls forward into another spot, reaching for the speaker and turning the dial all the way up. Tinny music blares. Daddy turns the dial down, rolls up his window a few inches, and hangs the speaker inside the truck cab. Okay, kids, Daddy calls as we jump from the truck and scatter. Meet back here when the movie's over. Mama's voice follows us as we scatter. <clears throat> you kids watch out for cars, you'll get run over. And stay away from them cars in the back of the lot, she adds. Do you hear me? Mama's shouted question hangs on the still summer air. We run between cars toward the giant white screen, stooping under wires strung between the speaker post and cars. Mosquito coils burn on dashboards in anticipation of the biting hordes that will descend after dark. We swerve and run along the unobstructed side of cars, racing toward the swings and the monkey bars near the concession stand. At the playground, strange kids are dressed in pajamas. We wear our regular clothes. 
Mama won't let us wear pajamas outside the bedroom, and neither would any of the other mamas we know. Junior goes to sit on a picnic table with his friends as we pump our legs, swinging toward the bluish-pink sky and hang upside down from the monkey bars. We squeal and chase each other in a giant game of tag. I'm not even sure who is it, so I get tagged right away. I go sit on a picnic table with the other tag kids until everyone is out. Then we start the game again. We are out of breath and sweaty by the time it's dark and cicadas begin their hypnotic throbbing song. The big spotlights dim on the screen and we scramble for a seat at the picnic tables. We lean our heads way back. Hot dog stands across the screen, arms linked with a paper cup of soda, urging us to go to the concession stand to have ourselves a snack. We won't be having any snacks tonight. Daddy paid our ticket. That is all we can expect. If we get thirsty, we can always go back to the truck where Mama has a gallon glass jug of water. But she might make us stay at the truck to watch the movie, so no matter how thirsty we are, we stay put at the picnic benches. A Bugs Bunny cartoon starts. Hey, what's up, Doc? We yell to each other and to no one in particular. Hey, what's up, Doc? Hey, what's up, Doc? We yell again and again trying to get the inflection just right. You kids, shut up, a man shouts from the first row of cars. Dave laughs and starts Woody Woodpecker's ha 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 ha. And then we are yelling it in unison over and over again. Ha 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 ha, ha 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 ha. A car door opens and slams and a man strides toward us. Where are your parents, he roars. His question hangs in the dark, humid air. Only the cicadas answer as we scatter, laughing, running past open car windows toward the safety of Daddy's truck. Hey, Dave asks, pausing behind a car. Want to go bushwhacking? Vic says, yeah. I don't hesitate. Yeah, let's go bushwhacking. I don't know what bushwhacking is, but it sounds like something we shouldn't be doing. <clears throat> A couple of neighbor kids chime in. Yeah, they say, although I'm pretty sure they don't know what bushwhacking is either. Dave waves his arm in a silent, come this way. We get quiet and follow him to the back row of the lot. We walk single file and slowly in front of the cars, trying not to make the gravel crunch under our feet, although I don't see anyone in the cars. They're probably at the concession stand, I think, maybe having a grape soda and some popcorn. That's what I'd get if I had money for snacks. Dave stops and holds up his hand. We freeze. He stares hard at a big black car. I stare at the big black car, but I don't see anything. Finally, Dave says, get down. We crouch down in the gravel as he lays out the plan. You have to be real quiet. He points to Vic and a couple of neighbor kids. You and you and you, go around back of the car. He nods at a bigger neighbor kid and me. You guys stand on the sides and I'll take the front. When I yell bushwhack, you hit the car and run around it yelling bushwhack. Got it? We nod as he rises and walks in a stoop toward the car. We skulk behind, watching for his signal. He points and makes a motion so that we know to circle the car. I slink silently into my assigned place at the driver's door. Inside the car, I see a boy and a girl scrunched down in the front seat, front seat kissing, kissing. Suddenly, Dave yells, bushwhack, and the attack begins. The boys run around the car yelling, bushwhack, laughing and hitting the car with their palms and fists. The boy and girl pull apart in confused mid-kiss and sit up looking around. I'm not sure, but I think kissing is how you make babies. I look into their flushed, stupid faces. Are they making babies at the drive-in? Vic bumps into me and pushes me, yelling, come on, and running past me toward the safety of Daddy's truck. I look back at the car. The light comes on as the driver's door opens and I see that the girl is smoothing her hair. Other faces pop up in the front and back windows of the empty cars we had slunk past. Hey, you little brats, get back here, the boy bellows, his command hanging in the close night air. I turn and run after Vic to the safety of Daddy's truck. I see Dave and the neighbor kids running toward the playground. They'll probably stay there until the movie's over. Vic and I climb into the bed of the truck, stooping to look at the screen through the truck's back window. Tonight, it's a shoot 'em up western, Daddy's favorite because he used to be a cowboy a long time ago. We climb onto the truck's roof, stretch out on our stomachs, and look upside down through the windshield. 
Even with the thundering horse's hooves and popping six shooters, Mama's eyes are closed. She's rocking Roger to sleep. Tomorrow, Daddy will tell us how the movie got it all wrong and how cowboys really live. But tonight, his face glows in the light from the screen, and he smiles as horses thunder across the desert. Good guys chase bad guys, and bad guys chase good guys, and everyone chases the Indians. We are yawning by the time a white-hatted cowboy saves the day, and the spotlights come up on the big screen. Daddy waits for the kids to come back to the truck. Are you sure you got everybody, Daddy? Mama asks as he starts the truck. He hangs the speaker on the post and answers, I don't know, I didn't count. Teddy leans out the window and shouts to the hot squirming kids in the back of the truck, if you're not here, speak up. We laugh. Daddy says this every time. We laugh every time. Daddy starts the truck and turns on the lights, joining the line of cars exiting behind the big screen. We wave to the carload of pajama-clad kids we recognize from our giant game of tag. They yawn and wave back. Daddy drives down Indianapolis and pulls into the driveway. The neighbor kids spill over the sides of the truck yelling, thanks, Mr. Ryburn, and see you tomorrow, Dave, as they run toward the home, run toward home. Like rats from a sinking ship, Daddy laughs. My brothers jump from the truck running for the house, but I slump in the bed of the truck, my eyes scrunched tight, pretending to sleep. Daddy's door slams and then Mama's. I can sense that they are standing next to the truck looking at me. Daddy reaches under my arms and swings me out of the truck, carrying me in his arms toward the house. My head lolls on my shoulders and I let my arms hang limp like a rag doll. Mama's voice follows us. Raymond, she's just pretending to sleep. Set her down and let her walk. Daddy ignores her and carries me into the bedroom, tossing me onto my bed with a laugh. My eyes pop open. Good night, sis, he says with a wink. Tonight I'll dream of horses thundering across the desert and good guys chasing bad guys and bad guys chasing good guys and my daddy, the buck knight hero, as the white-hatted cowboy who saves the day. And then my dad put us all in the back of a truck and drove us all to California. That's a whole other program, whole other story. But this is us on the beach, um, my baby brother Roger, here. <clears throat> we moved into a neighborhood that wasn't really a very nice neighborhood. I think you get the impression we were very poor, so we, of course, wouldn't be living high on a hill. So this story is called The Mark of, Z of Zorro. One night a week, the neighborhood Salvation Army Red Shield Club shows the movie for the neighborhood kids. My brothers are reluctant to take me, not only because they don't want to be bothered with me, but because even then there was gang activity in San Francisco. You take her or you're not going to the movies, Mama says to my brother's scowls. That night as we leave, Vic flips open a rusty pocket knife with a broken blade and hands it to me. Use it if you have to, he says, waving his in the air without explaining what constituted a have to situation. Junior says, if anything goes down, just run for home. I presume that someone will tell me when something is going down. I put the folded knife in my pocket and nod. I skip along behind as my brothers and their friends walk the several blocks to the club where we sit on cold metal folding chairs. The room goes dark and we rock in our chairs laughing and cheering as Bugs Bunny taunts Elmer Fudd and Elmer Fudd chases Bugs Bunny. Porky sputters, that's all folks, and the screen goes dark. And then it begins, the music, the scroll of credits, and there he is on the screen. Spanish gentleman Don Diego Vega, sword fighting and jumping his horse over stanchions, making wagers with his compadres. But Don Diego isn't the dandy he seems. By day he is a listless, bored California caballero, but by night he is Zorro, riding hell for leather across a darkened countryside, his mask disguising his true identity, his cape flying in the wind. He rides to avenge the helpless, to punish cruel politicians, and to aid the oppressed. We cheer as Zorro's sword flashes across the movie screen, zip, 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 just like that. 
and a Z is carved into a handbill on a wall or the chest of bad guys. We cheer as he triumphs over them. By the time the end flickers onto the screen, he has overthrown the corrupt government and alleviated his people's suffering. As the credits roll, we applaud and the boys whistle. The lights come up and we blink our way to the table where volunteers hand out bologna sandwiches. We wash down the sandwiches with red Kool-Aid before stepping out into the darkened street. My brothers and their friends finger their pocket knives. I pat my pocket to make sure that I have mine. We walk in silence for a block or two and then Junior yells, run! It was going down. I run towards home, footsteps pounding behind me. Someone yells, where's your sister? Junior grunts, up there. I run up the two flights of stairs and pound on our front door, my brothers on my heels. Mama jerks open the door. What are you kids up to, she demands as we clatter past. That night, I tumble into bed and dream of a solitary ride across a darkened countryside, a mask disguising my true identity, my cape flying in the wind. This one's called the Zorro Club. The day after we see the movie at the Red Shield Club, Dave and Vic start the Zorro Club. They tear up an old shirt of daddy's to ma make their masks and use big diaper pins to fasten towels around their shoulders. I can't have a mask or cape because I haven't been initiated into the club yet. Besides, my brothers reserve the role of Zorro for themselves. After all, I am a girl, and if I don't want to be Zorro's girlfriend, Lolita, I would have to be Captain Pasquale or Sergeant Gonzalez neither of whom wore a mask. But I don't want to be any of them, most of all that silly, helpless Lolita. I want to be Zorro. Dave and Vic tie the triangle rag over their noses and then tear metal curtain rods from the windows, leaving the curtains puddled on the floor. Curtain rods are just the length for sword fighting, and with some practice they make the whooshing sound of Zorro's sword. Zip, zip, zip. We grab our swords and go to avenge the helpless. We hop around thrusting and parrying, clashing the curtain rods against, pardon me, against each other, hurling what we believe to be Spanish insults. <clears throat> zip, 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 swish our swords as, take that, you caballero dog, was answered by, prepare to die, you son of a peon bandito, as we clatter up and down the outside staircase to our second floor flat. We don't have Zorro's beautiful black horse, but we jump from stairs and climb fences, teetering on the top before leaping to the porch. We rappel down ropes only loosely tied around the porch railing of the second floor, rattling our swords in the air before dropping to the ground to aid the oppressed. We creep on Zorro's silent feet around our flat and roam the neighborhood, leaping from rooftop to rooftop in our quest to save the <clears throat> excuse me, save the peons from the evil alcalde while evading those who would imprison and hang us for defying the cruel politicians. We swear at each other with our limited Spanish vocabulary. Madre de Dios and Santa Maria, we shout as our curtain rods clash. Finally, we stand on the front porch panting. I brush the dirt from my permanently skinned knees. Can I be in the Zorro Club, I wheeze? If you pass the initiation, Dave says. It starts out easy enough. Jump off that step, Vic commands, pointing to the third step to our flat. I jump. Now that one, he orders as he points to the next step up. I jump. He points to the sixth step. I jump, landing in a bone-rattling crouch. Am I in the club? Vic turns his back on me. Dave says, not yet, you haven't passed the second initiation. With that, they lead me up the stairs and through our flat onto the back porch. A pulley clothesline stretches from our apartment to the building behind us. Dave points to the clothesline. You have to hold on to the rope and we'll pull you across and back. I look down at the concrete yard. It seems a long way down. Well, do you want to be in the Zorro Club or not? I climb over the porch railing and grab the clothesline. I'm heavier than the clothes that Mama hangs out to dry. The line sags. Dave and Vic tug on the bottom rope, and I'm soon dangling over the yard. They laugh and jiggle the rope as the clothesline droops. 
I do a hand over hand maneuver toward the porch and begin to swing my legs at the railing, trying to hook my feet under the bottom rail. Dave and Vic laugh and pull on the top rope, sending me back out over the yard. The rope is cutting into my hands. I begin to cry as I move along the line, hand over hand toward the distant porch. This time they pull me over the porch railing, scraping my shins. Am I in the club? I blubber as blood runs down my legs. No, Vic says, no crybabies allowed in the Zorro Club. I cry harder. Okay, okay, Dave says, there's one more initiation. If you pass that, you're in the club. I wipe my eyes and nose on my arm. Okay, what is it? I follow them back through the flat. You kids stay outside. The baby, Mama Whisper shouts as we clamber downstairs. A smelly stained mattress sits on the curb awaiting trash pickup. Dave and Vic pull it onto the sidewalk. We're going to roll you up and you have to stay in there till we say you can come out, Dave says. How long? Till we say, Vic says. This is the last initiation and then I'm in the club, right? They look at each other and nod. I stretch out on the mattress as they roll it up and sit on it. It smells funny. They begin to bounce up and down. I start to cry, but then realize that I'm having trouble breathing. I yell, but the mattress muffles my panic. The more I struggle, the harder it is to breathe. A faraway voice calls, what have you kids got in that mattress? Nothing, Mama, Dave says. Nothing, Mama, Vic echoes. Have you boys got a cat in there? No, Mama, Vic says. No, Mama, Dave echoes. Get up off that mattress right now, Mama commands, hoping to save another cat from torture. The mattress flops open as they reluctantly stand to reveal my blue face. I lie limp and gasping. How in the world did you get in there, Mama shouts from the porch. I gulp, gasping for air and shrug weakly. The Zorro Club didn't admit crybabies, and I won't risk membership by being a stool pigeon. The worst thing you could be was a stool pigeon. You kids get up here right now and put that nasty mattress back on the curb where it belongs. Mama goes back into the flat. Am I in the club? I finally croak as they drag the mattress back to the curb. They reluctantly agree to admit me. Yeah, you're in, but only if you get a Zorro mask and cape. Finally, I was going to be a full-fledged member of the Zorro Club. I run to Mama and beg her to make my mask. I don't know why you want to be in that old club, she sniffs, as if I needed further proof that mothers don't understand what is truly important in life. But she tears up another of Daddy's old shirts to make my mask, cutting a nose hole, then tying the rag around my face. She fastens a bath towel cape around my neck with a diaper pin. I run to show my brothers. At last, I would be in the club. Dave and Vic laugh. No one will believe you're Zorro. We can see your nose. Yeah, you got freckles, Vic exclaims. I cry and run back to Mama. I'm not making another mask for you. You kids have torn up all Daddy's old shirts. There's nothing wrong with that mask. Now get outside and play. Sadly, I walk down to the front porch and put my sword and cape and mask in the dented garbage can. Soon, Dave and Vic move on to the Dick Tracy Club, acquiring Dick Tracy walkie-talkies and skulking around our flat long after our exhausted mama had sunk into bed. But I never endured another initiation. The only club I wanted to belong to was disbanded. Truthfully, I never really wanted to be in the Zorro Club, I wanted to be Zorro, avenging the helpless, punishing cruel politicians, and aiding the oppressed. Sometimes still I tumble into bed and dream of a solitary ride across a darkened countryside, a mask disguising my true identity, my cape flying in the wind. Okay. So next, we moved to Nicholasville, Kentucky. And this is a picture of my Kentucky cousins. <clears throat> this story is called Mama the Prodigal Child. 
Mama was the baby of 21 children. Her father had married three times, remarrying after each of his first two wives died. Her mother, Annie, pardon me, was his third wife and had died a few weeks after giving birth to a baby girl who only lived a few months. Mama was two months old <clears throat> when she died. Or, I'm sorry, two years old when she died. Three years later, when her father recently buried, Mama had been lined up in the dirt road with the other newly orphaned children while their grown half-brothers and half-sisters selected those they would take to raise. Five-year-old Mama was the last to be chosen. She wasn't old enough to be of any help to anyone, and anyway, many of the older siblings had their own large families to care for. 16-year-old Margaret was chosen by Bill, who long before had moved to Bloomington, Illinois to work for the Chicago and Alton Railroad. Since their own mother's death, Margaret had been the closest thing to a mother that Mama had. Some of the older children insisted that whoever took Margaret had to take the baby. Bill had reluctantly agreed. Mama, the prodigal child. In November of 1956, we left Illinois for Kentucky. Daddy liked to drive at night. It was cooler, there was less traffic, and with seven sleeping children, there were no fights and fewer stops. It was the middle of the night when we loaded ourselves into the 47 Chevy truck with a custom cab that Junior bought for $250 after both the Studebaker and the old truck that Daddy bought in Bloomington had died. This truck had a plywood top and sides with canvas tie-downs. It was a nine-hour drive, a soon-to-be hot, cramped tangle of sleeping children and Daddy's hunting dog, Span. Behind the truck, Daddy's 12-foot aluminum boat held an outboard motor and all of our belongings. It's nearly noon when we pull up at the home of Aunt Thelma and Uncle Ernest. Before the truck even stops on the hard-packed dirt road, we push down the tailgate. Out jump my rumpled and grumpy older brothers, Junior David, Roger, and I emerge. Daddy steps from behind the wheel, yawning and stretching, as Mama swings her legs out of the truck and sets two-year-old Barb on the ground. Unfolding herself from the front seat, Mama stands, smoothing her wrinkled skirt and holding baby Mary. So here Mama stands in the middle of a dusty Kentucky road, a grown woman with seven children of her own. Pardon me for just a minute. Suddenly, the screen door slams against the weathered house siding, and women, later identified as ants, pour from the house, hooping and running in our direction. Skinny chickens and skinnier dogs scatter as the women run through the bare dirt of the yard toward us. I shrink against the truck and look to my brothers for their reaction. They stand their ground against this onslaught, so I do too. <clears throat> On the women come, house dresses and aprons.
a desperate grip. Their hoops turn to wails accompanied by tears. Mary, crushed by this female phalanx, adds her wail to theirs, causing them to increase their volume and intensity. Long, skinny fingers reach and grab, each woman trying to touch mama. Hazel, they wail. Hazel, honey. Oh, little Hazel, little Hazel. I look at my brothers for their reactions. <clears throat> Nothing. Their poker faces stare at the scene in the dirt road. Barb manages to wiggle her way into the melee and clutches the hem of Mama's dress. She adds her shrieks to the din. Hordes of children, later identified as cousins, suddenly appear <coughs> and stand in the yard, mesmerized by the show, as well as by the strange children glued to the truck fenders, exotic children from a faraway place, Illinois. Daddy saunters past the noisy and soggy scene and goes around the back of the truck to the subdued men standing at the edge of the road. <clears throat> These thin, chain-smoking men, later identified as uncles, grasp his hand, nodding their heads. Hey, Raymond, how do? What time y'all leave out? I turn back to the tangle of women who rotate in the road, kicking up dust. These women take turns clutching Mama to their ample or not-so-ample bosoms. Each time there's a pause in the weeping, another woman rotates into position, facing Mama and crying, Oh, Hazel, little Hazel. The sobbing begins anew. <clears throat> Just then, another aunt steps out onto the porch, grabs the basin, and flings the dirty water into the side yard. <clears throat> Long minutes pass as small children join their mothers, clutching house dress hymns and adding baby tears to the chorus. Others suck their thumbs and stare mournfully at the intruders. Mama raises her voice above the din. I'm home, I'm home, I'm home, she cries. The lamentation ebbs and flows, but at last the women pull themselves away and step back. Their faces are red and splotchy. They blow their noses on hankies retrieved from the belts of their house dresses and wipe their eyes on aprons or sweatered arms. The children, realizing the show is over, wander away to shouts of, don't y'all run off, we're fixing to have dinner. The sniffling women turn and walk as a group towards the house, still touching Mama's arms and shoulders. Mary's and Barb's cries subside, but Barb holds tightly to Mama's dress, pulled along by the women through the dirt. At the edge of the road, the women part, <clears throat> and Mama's brothers step forward, giving her a quick hug and a quiet, hey, Hazel, before turning back to Daddy and each other. My brothers join the men as they move to the rickety chairs under the trees. One of the uncles picks up a guitar and begins to strum. One or two of them blink and wipe their eyes on the backs of their hard, calloused hands, pretending that dust or the sun momentarily caused their eyes to water. I follow along as Mama is ushered through the small living room into the hot kitchen and guided to a straight back chair at the end of the table. She sits, and Mary and Barb jockey for position on her lap. Pots bubble on the blazing cook stove. Quickly, women snatch battered lids off pots and pans, scooping hot food into bowls and onto platters. One ant sets the silverware alongside mismatched plates and cups turned upside down on the table to combat the flies and dust coming through the screenless open window. Another ant dips water from a galvanized bucket into an old coffee mug and hands it to Mama, who gulps it down. <clears throat> Daddy and the uncle sing in the yard. Down in the valley, valley so low, hang your head over, hear the wind blow. I sidle up to Mama and whisper to her, although I might as well have shouted it, since she immediately announces to the room that I need to use the bathroom. One of the cousins is directed to accompany me. <clears throat> I follow as we head out the front door, down the steps, and across the yard, eventually arriving at a small ramshackle building. She holds open the door for me, revealing a wooden bench where flies buzzed. My cousin waits patiently, fanning the door a little and gesturing towards the bench, maybe thinking that I was a little slow. I lean forward slightly and see two holes in the bench, a big one and a little one. She stands silently pointing and jerking her head toward the bench. I hold my breath and step inside. My cousin lets the door slam, leaving me alone in the dimness. 
Luckily, I am prone to tantrums and can hold my breath for several long minutes. Just as I burst through the door, one of the ants steps onto the porch and begins hollering for us to come get washed up for dinner. I wait for each ant to take her turn calling her own children, but no other call is necessary. They come from everywhere, swarms of skinny children, sweaty from games of tag, dirty and scraped from jumping off the hen house. An unused bar of soap sits next to the chipped granite wash basin teetering on the old washstand. Wash <clears throat> a limp gray towel hangs from a nail pounded into the clabbered siding. A boy cousin steps up and gingerly extends dirty fingers into the clear water, flicking a drop or two onto his face, bypassing the towel. He moves quickly into the house. My hungry brothers skip the face and hand washing altogether, following him in. Boy and girl cousins elbow each other aside as they push their way to the basin. Some of the girls use the towel. When they are all done, I plunge my hands into the basin, swirling them through the murky water, <clears throat> then reach for the towel. By now a muddy, soggy mess. I put it back on the nail and decide to air dry like the boys. I follow one ant through the house into the kitchen. Mama still sits at the end of the table, anchored by, her, by my sisters. But now, the table is filled with steaming platters of fried chicken, bowls of lumpy mashed potatoes, smooth brown gravy, corn, and green beans. Biscuits are being pulled from the oven, ready for the melting slab of butter and homemade blackberry preserves that wait on the table. Men file into the room and sit at the table while children cram the available floor space. Daddy, as honored male guest, is asked to offer thanks. <clears throat> he clears his throat as hungry children shuffle their feet, pushing and shoving their way closer to the table. The women glare at those who haven't yet closed their eyes squinty tight, daring them to make a sound. There is no peeking or talking during grace, and the women keep a sharp lookout for infractions, dealing out an occasional thump or smack to those who violate grace propriety. <clears throat> being disrespectful to the Lord is second only to being disrespectful to your mother. The first you pay for in a vividly described but distant hell, the second in immediate thumps and bumps. Daddy draws in his breath and speaks with his best grace voice, a serious, deep voice with strange inflections that causes children to clasp presumably clean hands to their chests while struggling to keep from giggling. Bless this food to our bodies, dear Lord, he intones. Bless those who've prepared it, and bless those who've gathered here to partake of your bounty. Short and to the point, no long discourse or pleas for world peace or relief for starving children in China. No one at this gathering will have to be reminded of who provided the meal or be urged to clean their plates. Enthusiastic and hungry-sounding amens echo from the walls and ceiling. Skinny women bustle around the kitchen, faces flushed, serving children's meals and grabbing a bite or two for themselves in between. The kitchen is hot and noisy as ants dish food onto plates held by the children. No gravy, Mama. A leg, please. I don't want no green beans. I don't want no green beans. No green beans, as a generous helping of green beans is ladled onto the plate. Children carry their plates and silverware to the living room or into the yard, perching on every available surface. The ants turn their attention to the men. They pile the men's plates with chicken, knowing which men like which pieces, dark or white, breast, thigh, or wing. They fill the plates with generous helpings of mashed potatoes and gravy and vegetables. They cut hot biscuits in half and slather butter on them, adding them to the pile plates. Mama is served after the men. <clears throat> I hang back staring. I have never seen Mama sit to eat. She usually hovers between the stove and the table, serving and fussing and urging food on Daddy and us. Now she's offered the platter of chicken and selects the breast. Could it be that she prefers this over the thigh that she normally eats? Her sisters quickly fill her plate, cut and butter her biscuit, and urge her to eat. You're looking a little peaked, Hazel. Eat yourself some of them green beans, honey. Canned them up myself. Mama feeds Barb and Mary from her plate, their faces raised and their mouths open like little baby birds. 
One of the ants spots me and shouts, Lord, honey, you must be starving. Let's get you a plate. Her arms reach between the eating men as she fills my plate, plopping my favorite chicken piece, a leg, into the mashed potatoes and gravy. <clears throat> I take my plate into the yard and sit on the ground near my cousins. We look out, on the corner, out of the corners of our eyes at each other, but none of us speak as we devour our dinners. We can hear the high voices of the women urging more and more food on the men, and Mama and the deeper voices of the men eventually swearing that they couldn't eat another bite. I'm plumb full, they say. Mama's I'll never eat again wafts out of the window. The men drift slowly out of the house and back into the yard, rolling and lighting after-meal cigarettes. We carry our empty plates to the kitchen where tubs of water are already heating on the cook stove for washing up. Babies are put down for naps on the bed in the back bedroom, and women begin the after-feast cleanup. The women sing as they scrape plates into cracked old bowls. The few scraps will feed the dogs. Go tell Aunt Rhody. Go tell Aunt Rhody. Go tell Aunt Rhody the old gray goose is dead. The men answer from the yard. Down in the valley, valley so low, hang your head over, hear the wind blow. An ant submerges plates, cups, and silverware in the scalding, soapy water of a granite roaster pan and scrubs them with a dish rag before moving them to a pan of scalding rinse water. Other ants pluck dishes from the, the second pan and dry them on thin, discolored dish towels. One ant stacks the dishes and puts them on the open shelves. Mama's offer to help is refused. You sit there, honey, and talk to us. We'll have these done in a minute, then we can visit. They begin to sing, go tell Aunt Rhody, go tell Aunt Rhody, go tell Aunt Rhody the old gray goose is dead. Mama joins in, it died in the mill pond, died in the mill pond, died in the mill pond, standing on its head. From the yard the men reply, hear the wind blow, love, hear the wind blow, hang your head over, hear the wind blow. If there is a heaven, I picture Mama sitting in a place of honor at a worn oilcloth covered table, being fussed over by her sisters, while her brothers and daddy sing in the side yard of a small weathered house. <clears throat> then we move back to San Francisco. This is my family in Golden Gate Park. You can see we kept with the chronological order. Dad, right down to Roger. And I wanted to get my sisters in the picture. That's Mary just next to me, and then Barb, Golden Gate Park. <clears throat> and then the last um, couple of pieces I want to do are when we move to the state of Oregon. And, um, This was our house. <clears throat> I was 12 in the summer of 1960 when Daddy moved us from San Francisco to live on a 10-acre farm on Old Mahama Road, east of Staten, Oregon. Here's home, kids. Daddy drives the gray Studebaker up the long, dusty lane, stopping in front of a small house with faded white paint. A couple of skinny trees in the yard struggle up through the tall weeds that dwarf the small porch. Daddy stops the car. We pile out and stand in the hot sun looking around. The only other buildings are a weathered pump house, an abandoned hen house, and a falling down outhouse. Look at kids, Daddy says, them are filbert trees. We look at the spindly trees. They grow hazelnuts, he laughs. We look at Mama, who is never amused when her name is associated with something funny, like witch hazel or nuts. Daddy quickly changes the subject, and we turn in the drive as, the point, as he points behind us to the tall pine tree <clears throat> that stands above the others on the hill behind the house. This farm is called Sore Thumb because that tree sticks out like a sore thumb. He either didn't know or chose not to explain 
that it was known locally as Rattlesnake Mountain for the venomous snake den on the hill above the house. Daddy opens the trunk and we grab a few bags of things Mama had packed for us in San Francisco. Daddy walks to the house and turns the knob on the unlocked front door. He ushers us in with a flourish. Here's home, kids, he announces. Oh, I also wanted to get my brother Ben in the picture. <laughs> he, uh, he's the youngest, and this is him in Oregon. My brothers Dave and Vic used to dress him up like this and take him to town because he was such a babe magnet, you know. He was so cute, and of course all the girls wanted to spend time with my brothers because of my baby brother. This is called Waiting Round the Bend. <clears throat> and I should preface it by saying that uh, we worked in the fields when we lived in Oregon, so we picked berries and beans and anything there was to do, we did. He's late, Vic says. My brother and I sprawl in the dust waiting for Daddy to pick us up. We're hot and sweaty and strawberry stickiness has dyed our lips and hands bright red. A parent waiting to pick up their strawberry-stained child turns on their car radio, twirls the dial, and settles on Andy Williams crooning, Moon River wider than a mile, I'm crossing you in style someday. Oh, dream maker, you heartbreaker, wherever you're going, I'm going your way. Now that we are in the shade, I tear off my straw hat and roll up the long sleeves of my shirt, squinting across the valley at the shimmering fields of hay that toss and wave in the wind. Oh, dream maker, you heartbreaker, wherever you're going, I'm going your way. Suddenly, the undulating hay transforms itself into a gently rolling river flowing down the hill, its origin a mystery and its destination unknown. Next year, I'm working in the cannery, Vic says. This is the dream of every kid who sweats in the relentless summer sun. At 16, you can trade the outdoors for the factory, better pay and not a single ray of sunshine. But for now, all day long, over and over, we crawl through the strawberry rows and fill the six cartons in our crates. We carry them to the supervisor who punches our cards. At the end of the week, we exchange the punched cards for cash. It isn't much, but it goes to the family for groceries and gas money and utilities anyway. The only perk to this job is eating as many strawberries as you can hold. Some of the kids grow sick of the sweet, sticky berries, but I eat my way through the fields, choosing only, only the plumpest, juiciest berries, red all the way through. No doubt they are tainted with pesticides and fertilizers, but it's 1961, and Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring has yet to be published. The only bright spot of the day is lunch, when we sit in the dust next to the field, jockeying for a place in the sparse shade of the only tree. We eat our limp, warm bologna sandwiches and drink from a mayonnaise jar, the warm red, undersweetened Kool-Aid provided by Mama. Dessert, of course, is a handful of the sweetest berries. I am proud when housewives drive out from town to buy fresh-picked strawberries, and the supervisor asks them to wait until I bring in my crate. After a few visits, they ask for me by name. Other kids put rocks and clods of dirt in the bottom of their cartons, hoping to fill them sooner and accumulate more punches on their cards. I have a reputation for selecting only the best strawberries. Well, really second best, the best being consumed by me in the field. This means fewer punches on my card, but an enormous sense of pride in my work. Dad's here, Vic calls out as the Studebaker rolls to a stop in front of us. We pile into the car as Andy Williams sings, two drifters off to see the world. There's such a lot of world to see. We're after the same rainbow's end, waiting round the bend, my huckleberry friend, Moon River, and me. How'd it go today, Daddy asks. Okay, Vic answers. Okay, I echo. As we drive down the dirt lane, I look back at the hay that shimmers in the sun. The river rolls on, down the hill, and out of sight. I crane my neck, seeking its destination. 
In that moment, I know that I won't be going to the canning factory. I know with certainty that I will drift with that river to see what is waiting round the bend. Thank you. <clears throat> to make sure that Terry has plenty of time to sign your books, we'll be taking two questions. Oh from the audience, if anyone has them. Just raise your hand. Yes, Barb. How many places did you actually live at? Barb asked how many places we actually lived. You know, I counted that one time. Um, well, let's see. We lived in Illinois, California, back in Illinois, Kentucky, California, and Oregon. And I went to seven grade schools and two high schools. So um, I don't know, I'm thinking it's upwards of 20 or 25. I think we equaled a military family in terms of moving. Yeah. One more question. I, I do want to say that I have two of my best friends in the audience tonight, Kathy Davis and Melanie Verbout, and they have each written their own memoir. And I await their publication with anxiety because they're going to be wonderful. So, anybody else doing a memoir? Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> Gary, you had a question. I just had a question. Uh, did your dad just make his whole living at afternoon uh, jobs uh, wherever you went? So, Gary wanted to know how my dad made his living. Um, my dad was a carpenter. And you know, right after World War II, he could get work anywhere because the GIs came home and they were you know, building houses everywhere for the GIs and their new families. So yeah, so he could work anywhere really. Uh -huh. Wonderful questions. Thank you all so much. Let's give another round of applause to Terry. Thank you. And we will see you all downstairs for the book signing. There are copies available for purchase in our Cruising with Lincoln on 66 Visitor Center and Gift Shop. Thank you so much.